Monsignor Witt, our own esteemed church historian here at Kenrick Glennon Seminary, will give the formal introduction to Dr. Madden. Um, I simply want to say tonight uh, that I want to express my gratitude to Dr. Madden and uh, my esteem for his many inter contributions, international contributions really, as a church historian. I'm sure that the large turnout tonight is because you recognize that his labors are really labors of love that build up the gift of faith for Catholics and Christians and really for, for all people, all women and men who are seeking the fullness of truth to quicken in their hearts a, a desire for truth and history, to see history through, through the lens of, uh, of faith. So Dr. Madden, thank you so much for coming, for uh, saying yes to our invitation to, to have you here this evening. Monsignor Witt. I count it a, a great honor and privilege to be asked to introduce our speaker for tonight's Peter Richard Kenrick Lecture, Dr. Thomas F. Madden. Dr. Madden has compiled an impressive resume. It goes on and on. <laughs> Full of books published, scholarly articles published, lectures given. He is professor of medieval history at St. Louis University. He's been known to teach a course around here from time to time. And he is also the director of the Center of uh, Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. But buried deep in his resume is the reason I most appreciate the professional work of Dr. Tom Madden. He has cooperated with recorded books in its Modern Scholar series to produce courses on compact discs covering such topics as heaven or heresy a history of the Inquisition, Upon This Rock, a history of the papacy from Peter to John Paul II, and God Wills It, Understanding the Crusades, among many other courses. The importance of these recorded books courses on CDs should not be underestimated. The Catholic Church is attacked on many levels. One of the most insidious is the assault on her history in popular literature and programming, often by those who pass themselves off to be experts. Recall the ridiculous sensation caused by Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. It is vital that we use the same media of popular literature and programming to counter these efforts. I have listened to and have taken notes on several of these recorded courses and have recommended them to others. I admire Dr. Madden's ability to defend the church without veering from the dictum of that great 19th century historian, Leopold von Rantke, to tell history wie es eigentlich gewesen, to tell history as it actually happened. It is refreshing to see lies, innuendos, and bold-faced misrepresentations put in their place by the gentle application of truth. The title of Dr. Madden's lecture tonight is Catholics and History, Seeking Truth, Dispelling Myths, and Finding the Holy Spirit Across the Centuries. I give you now Dr. Thomas Madden. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Monsignor Witt, and also uh, Father Horn. Also, thank you to uh, Monsignor Ramakati, and um, thank you all for coming, uh, Bishop Rice and uh, Your Excellency Archbishop Carlson. It's really a great honor for me to be asked to deliver this, the 19th Peter Richard Kenrick Lecture. I should say, unlike many of the previous Kenrick Lectures, I'm not a theologian uh, or a philosopher or really even very wise. I'm just an historian. And as an historian, my stock and trade is very much of this world. At its best, history is a careful and dispassionate investigation of our shared human past. It recognizes the extraordinary importance of religion as a catalyst and as a motivator, 
but it makes no judgment on the veracity of religion itself, for it has no basis on which to do so. At St. Louis University, much of my time is spent training doctoral students, which is why I like teaching here. <laughs> but those doctoral students are the next generation of professional historians. As you may know, uh, St. Louis University has the largest, and I would say the, the best, medieval history program in North America. It's something we're very proud of. But it is one thing to do history, and it is quite another to study it, to, to learn it. One produces, and the other consumes. Tonight, I would like to talk about the learning, the, the exploring of history through the eyes of Christianity. And in so doing, I hope to convince you that studying the history of the church can not only enrich and strengthen our Catholic faith, but it can also be a powerful tool of the new evangelization. I've come to this last conclusion through my own experience. And so if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. When I was young, it was never my plan to be an historian. I was going to be an astrophysicist. As a teenager, I could be found most evenings on my parents' back porch, hunched over my three-inch reflector telescope, and uh, hissing at anyone who dared to turn on the outside lights. I saw I was a geek. I had absolutely no interest in history. I considered it really to be a supreme waste of time. I was born in uh, 1960 in Phoenix, Arizona, and then moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico when I was 11. Although my parents were relatively poor, they sacrificed to provide my siblings and me with a Catholic education. I went to Catholic kindergarten, eight years of Catholic grade school, and three years of Catholic high school. When I graduated from all of that Catholic education, I knew absolutely nothing about Catholic church history and next to nothing about Catholic theology. How could that be? Well, it was the 1970s. And looking back on it, my grade school religion classes at least seemed to me to consist principally of cutting up magazines to produce collages and constructing hideous banners with an assortment of burlap and felt and <laughs> Elmer's glue. During junior high, I was a server every day at morning mass, and I lectured twice a week. And yet, I still had only the fuzziest concept of what it all meant. High school was worse. Theology consisted of art appreciation, sex education, and what I can only say were rap sessions in which it was largely left to us to develop our own codes of moral behavior. Looking back on it, I can see that as students, we were, we were truly hungry for the truth, yet the truth didn't seem to show its face to us. I don't mean to be uncharitable or ungrateful to any of my old teachers. Um, fortunately, this was in New Mexico, so I'm sure none of them are here. <laughs> as I said, it was the 1970s, and many sincerely believed that a new and a very different approach to religious education was necessary. In my experience, that did not work out. A great many people in my generation, and many of my friends, were lost, rejecting the faith before they ever had a chance to truly know it. History classes were rare in those days, having sw been swallowed whole by a lukewarm social studies curriculum. Church history was non-existent. Like many young Catholics, particularly in my generation, I drifted away from the church when I went to college. The University of New Mexico, where I landed for lack of a better alternative, was a massive educational whale that, in which commuter students like myself were just the krill it consumed and either digested us or spit us out. After three years of struggling with math and science, I finally came to the heartbreaking conclusion that I was simply not very good at astrophysics, at least not good enough to make a living at it. 
And so my choices were few. Either drop out and start focusing on my current career, which consisted of waiting tables and tending bar, or find something else to study. I hated waiting tables. I didn't mind tending bar. In fact, I still like that. <laughs> so I cast about for something, anything, in which I might do well. Well, you probably know where this is going. I took an introductory history course, Western Civilization to 1600. It was taught by an enthusiastic professor to a room full of 400 or so undergraduates. From the very beginning, I was absolutely fascinated. I could not take notes quickly enough. At the end of the class, I was almost out of breath, cursing the clock for bringing it all to an end. It was a story that I had never heard before. The Egyptians, the Hittites, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. It was all so absolutely fascinating. Then we came to the Middle Ages. And there I found, much to my amazement, was the Catholic Church. And it was not just one denomination, just one take on Jesus Christ. It was the only denomination, the only church, and virtually everyone was a member. Although I was a very poor Catholic, I could not help but take pride in the fact that my church was truly ancient. And what struck me most clearly was that in an age of chaos and violence, um, and I mean the Middle Ages, not, not the 1970s. So. <laughs> in which the norm for secular leaders was to act like childish or wicked bullies, it was really the Catholic Church that seemed to me to consistently act like an adult. No one made it do that. Indeed, for centuries, it was expected that those in power would use their power to exploit or to harm those weaker than themselves. But the church preached against that, even though the world wanted it. Near the end of the semester, we came to the 16th century and the Protestant Reformation. Now, there's just no way to teach the Protestant Reformation without getting one's hands dirty with some basic theology. I remember listening intently as my professor explained that the dispute revolved around justification a word that I had never heard before in relation to religion. The question was, were we justified by faith with works or by faith alone? Both sides made sense to me. I remember eagerly waiting for the professor to reveal to me which side was the Catholic one. And when I heard it, I surprised myself at how quickly I accepted it. At last, I had learned a little bit of theology. And at last, I was finally being introduced to the history of the Catholic Church. And it had all come from an overfilled course in a dingy classroom at a large public university. It was then that I started to go back to Mass. A friend of mine back then, surprised by my newfound religion, accused me of not really believing all that Catholic jazz but just being seduced by all that Catholic history. And to a certain extent, I think he was right. But the point is, I was seduced. I was drawn back into the church through its historical majesty. I was, in other words, evangelized. There was still much more to my journey in the faith, but the first little steps had been taken. And without those, no journey is possible. It should not surprise us, although it does, that learning the history of the Catholic Church can bring one closer to the faith. Christianity is an historical religion. Christians believe that God came into the world, that he literally became part of history. And not just a mythical history, but a precise period and a precise location. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's Luke chapter two. Saint Augustine would later argue that God chose precisely this period, the height of Roman power and the peace that came with it to send his son into the world. 
For it was during the Pax Romana that Christ's message of truth could take root and spread throughout the known world. Centuries later, during St. Augustine's own time, the Roman Empire was collapsing. But by then, the church was strong, able not only to survive the fall of Rome, but to guide the West forward into and through a new age. And this brings me to a, a crucial point. The culture in which we live, Western culture, is in large part a product of the Catholic Church. There are a great many people today who dislike the church or its teachings, but who have completely adopted uniquely Western concepts that directly come from those same teachings. To give just a, a couple of examples, most of us today would accept that the institution of slavery is a bad thing. Yet throughout history, slavery was an integral component of virtually all human societies. From ancient China, to sub-Saharan Africa, to pre-Columbian Americas, to the islands of the South Pacific, slavery was not only commonplace, but in most societies, it was considered a right and proper part of the natural order. Western cultures before Christianity believed precisely the same thing. The ancient Greeks and Romans embraced slavery in every aspect of their societies. It was only in Western Europe where the Catholic Church instructed the faithful that slavery began to be seen as an evil. Now, you could find slaves in medieval Europe, although usually only in port cities, and even there they were relatively rare. But across Europe, agricultural manual labor and other forms of manual labor was done by free peasants or by serfs. Now, it's certainly true that serfs were bound to the land, not free to leave their properties. But they were by no means slaves. They could not be bought or sold. Families could not be broken up. They did not belong to their lord. They were not completely free, but they were not slaves. And why not? Why was medieval Europe so uniquely opposed to slavery? There were many factors at work, but at root was the Catholic faith. St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians had made clear that for Christians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This equality before God does not preclude slavery. Indeed, slavery is often referenced in the New Testament without condemnation. But it does dramatically redefine it. Slave cultures usually justify slavery by a belief in the inherent inferiority of the slave. It's their place to be slaves. Aristotle, for example, wrote in the politics, when there is such a difference as that between men and animals, the lower sort are by nature slaves, and it is better for them, as for all inferiors, that they should be under the rule of a master. Now, this may seem harsh, but Aristotle was just summing up the normal and accepted opinion of almost everyone everywhere before the Middle Ages. Yet when we take away Aristotle's natural inferiority, as Christianity does, when we assert that all people are equal in the sight of God, the master no better than his slave, then slavery becomes harder to justify. Indeed, given the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, the slave seems to have the edge. It was this belief that led Christians eventually to banish slavery first from Europe and then from the world. Likewise, medieval Europe was unique in its treatment of women, and for the same reason. The soul of a woman is no different than the soul of a man. Now, this is very different from many other societies, including ancient Greece. Um, Aristotle held that women were inherently less than men and must therefore be ruled by them. Now, I don't want you to think that medieval Europe was a feminist paradise. Um, it wasn't. But it did recognize the rights of women that most other societies did not. 
Women, for example, could own property. They could leave that property in their wills. But even more significant was the Catholic woman's right to make a decision about the most important things in her adult life. I don't know of any other society in the pre-industrial world that allowed this. It was common everywhere in the world, including in Europe, for marriages to be arranged, usually by one's parents. What set the Christian world apart was the fact that the woman had to agree to the marriage. Both parties had to agree to the marriage. In fact, they had to agree openly, and they had to speak that agreement. The church was very clear on this point. Without spoken mutual assent, there can be no union. Women in medieval Europe were among the freest in the world. During the 12th century, in fact, Muslim authors in the Holy Land who, who could see uh, Catholics from the West wrote of the scandal of these Catholic women who could freely speak to men who were not their kinsmen and even walk about the street on their own. The men of Europe, these Muslim authors believed, must be extremely weak since they were unable even to control their own women. And these are only a few of the things that the Catholic Church has given to the modern world, things for which we should be justifiably proud. Why then are Catholics so often ignorant of their own history? And why is it so seldom part of our discourse as Catholics? It seems to me that most Catholics, at least most American Catholics, are deeply distrustful of probing too far into the church's past. The last 2,000 years could perhaps best be summed up for many of us Catholics nowadays as the early church, which is worthy of study through the scriptures, then come many centuries of darkness, which are generally thought to be filled with power-hungry popes and mad monks and sadistic inquisitors and a whole sea of bonfires fed by scientific books and various brave heretics. Then comes Vatican II. <laughs> it's best then not to peel back the cover on those hideous middle centuries, but rather to keep them out of sight and focus on the early and the post-conciliar periods. Now, modern critics of the church know this, which is why they never tarry long before reaching for the well-worn cudgels of those middle centuries, particularly things like the Crusades and the Inquisition. Against these alleged crimes, Catholics have no defense. But we do have a defense, and it lies in the careful study of the history of the Catholic Church. Now, let me be clear at the start. There is no doubt that many, many Catholics have done wicked, sinful, abominable things throughout the past two millennia. Because the church's membership is entirely made up of sinners, it is hardly surprising that they sin. But that is very different than saying that it is the church which itself which sins. The dark history of the Catholic Church that I have described is not accurate telling of the events of the past. Rather, it really dates to the 16th and 17th centuries when Europe was being torn apart by various religious conflicts. From the beginning of the Reformation, Protestants faced a real difficulty with church history. Jesus Christ had lived and died in the first century. There was no getting around that. Then came the apostles. But what about the 15th, cent excuse me, the 15th centuries that separated the Protestants from those early days. Catholics in the 16th century could point to an unbroken history stretching directly back to the time of the apostles. The Protestants could not. This left them open to the accusation, made often by Catholics at the time, that Protestantism was something completely new. Otherwise, why would Christ found his church in the first century only to let it disappear until the 16th. Now, Protestant thinkers came up with various explanations for this gap. Some claimed, for example, that the true church 
had always existed, only that it had become hidden underground, fearful of persecution by the Catholic Church. Crucial to most explanations, however, was demonstrating a clear perversion of the church in order to separate the contemporary Catholic Church from the church that one could read about in scriptures. A new narrative had to be crafted in which the Catholic Church was not the ancient church, but an imposter, a changeling, a creation of man or the devil. And so its fruits had to be evil. In our American society, most of the commonly accepted tropes of the pre-modern past are really products of Reformation England. Between the 16th and 17th centuries, the printing presses of Britain produced histories and pamphlets that in many cases redefined church history. The images that are conjured in the modern mind when, when, when we think about things like the Crusades or the Inquisition rely heavily on those histories. It's amazing that most people today have a fairly strong and well-defined opinion about medieval activities like the Crusades and the Inquisition, but it is an opinion formed with access to almost no facts. Indeed, the gap between historical reality and common opinion on these events is so great that some historians, some professional historians that I know, have just given up trying to close it. It's much easier just to talk to each other, to talk to ourselves, rather than to engage a popular audience. And that's because the popular caricature of these events is just too strong, and so many segments of society have too much invested in it to ever let it go. So let's briefly look at just these two aspects of church history, the Crusades and the Inquisition. I've written fairly extensively on these subjects, particularly the Crusades, so I'll present here just some very, very basics, which I hope will clear away the most forbidding obstacles to learning more about them. First, the Crusades. Since most people already have a vivid image in their minds of what the Crusades were, it might be easier for me to say what they were not. They were not wars of conversion. They were not wars of colonialism. They were not looting expeditions led by the second sons of Europe, eager to carve out new kingdoms for themselves. They were not wars against Islam. They were not a tool of a threatened papacy. They did not bring spices and wealth to Europe, thus bolstering its economy. They did not materially damage the Islamic empires, and therefore they have nothing at all to do with the current state of the Middle East. They included no rivers of blood coursing down the streets of Jerusalem, nor were they led by wild-eyed preachers chanting that it is no sin to kill a Muslim, but rather a righteous deed. Okay, I admit, I got that last one from Hollywood. <laughs> what were they? They were a belated response to more than four centuries of Muslim conquests of Christian lands in which two-thirds of those lands had already been lost. They were a direct response to a plea for help from the Christians of the Middle East, particularly those in Constantinople and Asia Minor, what's today Turkey, to defend them from Turkish invasions that had moved relentlessly westward for decades. They were a reaction to a century of persecutions and massacres of Christians in the Holy Land, which had left thousands dead, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest place in the world for Christians, a pile of rubble and ruins. At some point, Christianity, both as a religion and as a culture, either defended itself or was subsumed by Muslim conquests. The Crusades were that defense. Crusaders were not saints. Indeed, they were terrible sinners. That's why they spent enormous amounts of their own wealth and put their lives in great danger for these faraway campaigns. When calling the first crusade in 1095, Pope Urban II declared that those who took up the cross of Christ and marched to the east for the relief of their Christian brothers and sisters, that they would receive 
a plenary indulgence. In other words, the crusade would serve as a full penance for all of the crusader's sins. These men who took the cross were professional warriors. They lived by the sword, and they were deeply aware of the fact that they were endangering their eternal life by doing so. As an act of charity and love of neighbor, the crusade provided a means for these men to use the one thing they knew how to do well, to fight, for the salvation rather than the perdition of their souls. That is why they crusaded. Indeed, it's the only explanation that makes any sense. If the crusaders were simply ne'er-do-wells and brigands seeking rape, slaughter, and robbery, as they are often portrayed today, they would have done much better to stay at home where there were plenty of ripe targets for such activities, even non-Christian targets close at hand. The First Crusade was the only campaign in history that saw thousands of warriors march thousands of miles deep into enemy territory for no good strategic reason. As scholars have learned over the last 50 years, the Crusades only make sense when we understand the pious idealism that lies behind them. Now, the Crusades were wars, and that means that people died. But the numbers of those killed in the Crusades, while lamentable, has been grossly exaggerated. It's always astonishing to me to hear the common taunt that religion has caused the deaths of more people than any other idea conceived by man. It's simply ludicrous. Massacres occurred during the Crusades, of course, but they were relatively rare. To take one of the worst examples, after the Crusader conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, approximately 3,500 Muslims and Jews were killed. That's not good. But how does that compare to modern non-religious wars? Well, for example, during World War II, a war of modern ideologies, that same number were killed every three hours, round the clock, 24-7, for six straight years. And nothing in the Middle Ages, no war or religious persecution of any sort, can come close to the wholesale slaughter that communism visited on the 20th century, an ideology that banned religion of all kinds. But returning to the Crusades, despite centuries of effort, ultimately they failed to meet their military objectives. They failed to hold on to the Holy Land, they failed to save the Christian kingdoms of the East, and they failed to stop the relentless expansion of the Islamic world. By the 15th century, Crusades had become desperate attempts to save Europe itself from Muslim invasion. They failed at that too. But they succeeded as a devotional practice, which is just what they were. Modern Catholics should not be embarrassed by the medieval Crusades. In their age, and at their best, they were errands of mercy to right terrible wrongs. No one in medieval Europe doubted this. It is only in extreme hindsight that we have turned our faces from the sacrifices of those generations of crusaders. Next week, uh, on October 7th, the Universal Church will celebrate Our Lady of the Rosary. But how many will remember, or perhaps learn, that it marks the anniversary of a crusade victory, the Battle of Lepanto in 1571? This year, we celebrated the 800th anniversary of the birth of St. Louis. Like many of you, I heard many, many excellent lectures and talks and colloquia and some truly inspired homilies on the life of our medieval patron. And yet, in none of those homilies that I have had a chance to hear, was there any mention made of the king's crusades? I can tell you this would have struck St. Louis himself as positively bizarre. For him, the greatest devotional acts of his life were his crusades. Now, I understand completely why we might be reticent about bringing up Louis' crusades. His care for the poor and his devotion to the Eucharist translate much better to our own time 
than waging war to defend Christians of the Middle East. But it does mean that we have lost a large part of St. Louis and all that truly made him a saint. Okay, so what about uh, the Inquisition? Again, it's an extremely large and complex subject. Like the Crusades, the Inquisition continued for centuries and it changed much during that time. In fact, there are really many Inquisitions. What's important to understand, though, is that the medieval Inquisition was not created by the church to force people to remain Catholic, to torture those who had doubts, or to burn those who refused. Also, by the way, the Inquisition had no jurisdiction over Jews, so if you get your history from the Mel Brooks movie, The History of the World, Part One, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you on that. To understand the Inquisition, we have to remember that the Middle Ages were medieval. We should not expect people in the past to view the world and their place in it the way that we do today. I mean, you try living through the Black Death and see how it changes your attitude. For medieval people, religion was not something one did just at church. It was their science, their philosophy, their politics, their identity, and their hope for salvation. It defined them, it literally defined them as a people. It was not a personal preference, like a favorite color, but an abiding and universal truth. Heresy then struck at the heart of that truth. It doomed the heretic, endangered those near him, and tore apart the fabric of the community. In the Middle Ages, heresy was a criminal act, but not because it threatened the church, because it threatened the state. And you heard that right. Medieval monarchy was not based, like modern governments, on the will of the people. It was based on the will of God. Kings and emperors held their positions by the grace of God, king by the grace of God. They were anointed by God through his holy church. Therefore, to claim that Christianity and the Catholic Church were false was the same as denying the governing authority of the king, and thereby the legitimacy of the whole kingdom. It was, in other words, treason. And the penalty for treason in the Middle Ages, as it remains today in the United States, is death. When someone was accused of heresy in the early Middle Ages, they were often brought to the local lord for judgment, just as if they had stolen a pig or damaged a royal shrubbery. That was actually, a, that was a crime in medieval England. Yet unlike with pigs and shrubbery, it was not so easy to discern whether the accused was really a heretic. For a start, one needed some basic theological training something most medieval lords sorely lacked. The result is that people were often executed by secular authorities just to be on the safe side without a competent assessment of the validity of the charge against them. The Catholic Church's response to this problem was the Inquisition, first instituted by Pope Lucius III in 1184. It was born out of a desire to provide fair trials for accused heretics using laws of evidence and presided over by knowledgeable judges. From the perspective of the secular authorities, heretics were traitors to God and king and therefore deserved death. From the perspective of the church, heretics were lost sheep that had strayed from the flock. As shepherds, the pope and bishops had a duty to bring them back into the fold, just as the good shepherd had commanded them. So while medieval secular leaders sought to safeguard their kingdoms, the church was trying to save souls. The Inquisition provided a means for accused heretics to escape death and to return to the community. Modern scholarship into the medieval records has made clear that most people accused of heresy before inquisitions were either acquitted or their sentence was suspended. Those found guilty of grave error were allowed to confess their sin, do penance, 
and be restored to the body of Christ. The underlying assumption of the Inquisition was that like lost sheep, heretics had strayed. If, however, an inquisitor determined that a particular sheep had purposefully left the flock, there was nothing more that could be done. Unrepentant or relapsed heretics were excommunicated and given over to the secular authorities. Despite popular myth, the medieval inquisition did not burn heretics. It was the secular authorities that held heresy to be a capital offense, not the church. The simple fact is that the medieval inquisition saved uncounted thousands who would otherwise have been roasted by secular lords or by mob rule. Now, I've mentioned the Crusades and the Inquisition because they are both so often a stumbling block for Catholics who want to look into their own history. There are also two events in Catholic history that are regularly and grossly distorted. I do not mean to say that there were not evil deeds done by evil men during the Crusades and the Inquisition. There were. That is the nature of sin. But I do mean to say that that was not their purpose. And both also did great good, saving lives and defending the defenseless. Honestly, I don't understand why those who wish to embarrass or criticize the church so quickly reach for the Crusades and the Inquisition. Any modern history book written by a professional historian will prove these common stereotypes to be completely wrong. Now, if I were going after the church, I would focus on the 10th century popes. <laughs> a group of ruthless scoundrels and criminals who fought, murdered, or bought their way onto the throne of St. Peter. But that unhappy episode brings me, believe it or not, to my final point about the use of church history for evangelization. As Catholics, we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, instituted the church, and as he promised, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We also believe that he founded the church on the rock of St. Peter, to whom he gave, as he said, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit, as he called it, the spirit of truth, to be with the church forever. I will not leave you orphans, he said. After his resurrection, Jesus told his apostles, his church, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. These are extraordinary statements. Jesus, a poor preacher in Judea, is telling a handful of followers that they are the beginning of something that will last until the end of time. Nothing, not even the gates of hell, can defeat the church. But human institutions do not work like that. They grow, they change, and then they die. Yet if Jesus was indeed the Son of God, then we should expect his church to act rather differently. In other words, the human institution of the church, the one that historians like me can watch, should do something that human institutions do not do. It should live. And so the church has done. By all historical reckoning, that handful of apostles should have scattered with the disappearance of their master. Instead, working from town to town, the faith of Christ and his church spread out of Judea and across much of the known world. And it did all that without ad campaigns or armies or even powerful patrons. There is not one human institution that existed during the days of Jesus Christ that still exists today, except that one that he founded with his 11 friends. 
not one. There are religious religions and ideas that have survived, that is true. One thinks naturally of Judaism, as well as Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism. It could be argued that ancient Greek philosophy is also alive and well in modern Western culture. But none of these have institutions which have lasted through the centuries. The Academy of Athens is gone, and so too are the kings of Israel. The Roman Empire, which for many early Christians seemed almost eternal, has long ago fallen. And yet, the Catholic Church remains. Across the 20 centuries that separate us from the founding of Christ's church, one can see the rise and fall of countless empires and kingdoms and states. Many of those trained their considerable power and violence against the church in an attempt to wipe it out completely. Yet they are all gone. And the Catholic Church remains as vibrant today, indeed more vibrant today, than ever. One can take great comfort in that precisely because it is so improbable. What Christ promised, history has confirmed. As Catholics, we also believe that St. Peter and his successors are protected by the Holy Spirit from all error when defining doctrine regarding faith and morals. Now, it's one thing to posit that a human institution could last for 2,000 years. I mean, it's exceedingly rare, but it has happened a few times in history. Uh, the Roman state, in one form or another, survived for about 2,200 years, although it was exceptionally weak and very small during its last centuries. But it strains credulity to believe that the heads of that institution could avoid error on any topic, let alone one central to the institution's purpose for so long. Humans make errors. They change their minds. Or as politicians say today, they evolve. <laughs> Consider our own short history as a country. When the United States was founded, slavery was a legally protected institution. As three-fifths of a full human being, slaves were part of the US Constitution. Today, most of us would consider that to be a grave error. And in fact, the Constitution was amended to correct that error. Clearly then, as Catholics, we believe something that, if true, seems truly miraculous. How could any group of leaders be protected from error in their core mission for even one century, let alone 20 of them? But they have. From St. Peter to Francis I, no pope has ever promulgated error in faith and morals. The Catholic Church has never had to deal with a heretic pope. And across the centuries, there were a great many heresies to choose from. In the first millennium of church history, the other patriarchal sees, sees like Constantinople or Alexandria or Antioch, uh, these other sees routinely preached heresy. And then later, Later, they were condemned by church councils and, in fact, their own successors. For example, the patriarchs of Constantinople have often taught heresy and condemned Rome for not accepting those heresies. These were sometimes uh, Christological heresies, such as Arianism or Monophysitism, but they could also be something like iconoclasm, which declared the sinfulness of venerating holy icons. In all of these cases, the popes in Rome even when faced with torture, imprisonment, and military attacks, as they sometimes were, refused to promulgate any heretical teachings. And in almost all cases, the popes actively worked against those heresies. This striking fact that no pope has ever taught error in faith and morals has naturally been a sore point for those who reject the fullness of papal authority. Eastern Christians, Protestants, even some Catholics, have found this to be a particularly troubling aspect of the church's past. After all, if history demonstrates that strain from Rome leads to error, then that does not bode well for those who wish to stray from Rome. Critics of the church 
can study the history of the papacy and they can find there a great deal of sin. But they have difficulty finding the contradictions that would allow them to demonstrate error. What they need is something that the other patriarchal sees had in abundance, a pope who proclaimed that the solemn teachings of his predecessor were wrong. Yet even the lecherous, thieving popes of the 10th century that I just mentioned never decreed error in faith and morals. That alone is demonstration of the Holy Spirit's protection of the papacy. Any one of them could easily have done so. It would have been nothing for one of those papal embarrassments to have disclaimed the Trinity or defined a heretical idea of Christ's nature, but none did. Since there are no clearly heretical popes, critics of the papacy have traditionally been forced to dig much deeper into church history, searching for anything that might cast doubt on the unique authority of Rome. After centuries of digging, the critics have found only three fairly obscure popes who they use regularly to disclaim papal infallibility, and I'll mention them just briefly. The first is Pope Liberius, who in the fourth century was exiled from Rome by the emperor because he refused to accept uh, a heresy, the Arian heresy. After two years in exile, Liberius signed something, historians still argue over precisely what that something was, and he was allowed to return to Rome. It is possible that under duress, he signed in approval of the heresy as critics maintain. Yet even so, his written denial of Christ's true nature would have been little different than St. Peter's own denial, also under duress. Whether Liberius did this or not, he never decreed, defined, or taught heresy. Quite the contrary. When he returned to Rome, he renewed his fight against it. The second example that's often used is Pope Vigilius, who in the sixth century also refused to accept Constantinople's latest heresies. He was arrested and sent to Constantinople, where he was forced to remain in prison and suffer violent abuse for the next six years. Eventually, he was allowed to return to Rome, but the precise conditions of his release are not clear, and it may be uh, that he agreed to something which never came out. And finally, there is Pope Honorius I, who reigned for 13 years in the seventh century. Honorius was not arrested, but he wrote a letter to the Patriarch of Constantinople, which while vague, could be construed as supporting the Eastern heresy du jour, known as monoenergism. It really depends on how one reads that letter. So that's it. That is the entire history of papal fallibility on faith and morals stretching across 2,000 years and 266 popes. However, as you may have noticed, in none of these cases did the pope in question decree, promulgate, or even preach the error of which he is accused. No pope ever did such a thing. The Holy Spirit does not protect popes from signing evil documents under duress, nor does he keep them from writing confusing or ill-considered letters. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, protects the Bishop of Rome from error in the defining of doctrine on faith and morals. And that's all. In order to disprove that, one, needs to sh one need not shuffle through papal correspondence or imaginatively posit statements made behind closed doors. For the pope to err in this way, it must be plainly visible to all, just as similar errors made by other patriarchs and bishops were plainly visible to all. There is just nothing like that in the history of the papacy. Historically, that is remarkable. It's almost unbelievable. For the faithful, however, it is a visible miracle. When Christ founded the Catholic Church, he promised certain things, things which are historically absurd. He promised that the gates of hell could not prevail against the church, that it would remain until the end of the age, and that the rock of St. Peter would have an unerring authority from God. History is the canvas on which this miracle has played out.
It is the stage on which the Holy Spirit has demonstrated his unending love and care for the church and its people. To learn church history is, I believe, to see the hand of the Holy Spirit at work, just as Christ promised. Catholics are blessed to be members of that ancient church which still vibrantly endures. They should not be frightened of exploring its richness. The history of the church is a marvel, one that can be a tool of evangelization. And there are today many ways to approach it, either on one's own or as a community. Uh, the adult education series, Epic, which is published by Ascension Press, uh, is an excellent way to introduce church history at the parish level. There are also many excellent books. Uh, one of the most recent is by my colleague at St. Louis University, James Hitchcock, who is sitting right here in the front row. It has a very difficult title, so you might want to write it down. It's called The History of the Catholic Church. <laughs> and if you prefer listening, as Monsignor Witt said, I've recorded dozens and dozens and dozens of lectures on church history, which are published by recorded books. If instead you would rather watch Catholic history on television, well, don't. <laughs> history and the entertainment industry do not get along very well. This is true for any history, not just Catholic history, but it's particularly bad for Catholic history. I do have high hopes, though, for a mini-series on the Crusades that will premiere next week on EWTN. Um, it's on, as I say, it's on the Crusades, it's four parts. Uh, I'm in some of it, but that certainly doesn't guarantee quality. <laughs> Still, if you have an interest, tune in. It's going to be on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings. If it does well, I'm, I'm told by the producers that they may uh, plan another mini-series on the Inquisition. The Catholic Church has always known that the study of its history helps to build the faith. In the early church, the letters of Paul and others were preserved and read at the mass. The medieval church recorded the lives of the saints, which it read to the faithful to provide examples of Christian heroism and models of the Catholic faith. More recently, Benedict XVI devoted many of his Wednesday audiences to exploring the theological giants of medieval Catholicism. Catholics must not lose their history or allow it to be distorted. I cannot promise you that studying the history of the Catholic Church will not at times be challenging, even ugly. It will be. That's the nature of man. But I can promise that it will also be inspiring and uplifting and faith building. For the more one studies, I believe, the more one sees that no purely human institution could do all that the Catholic Church has done. For, in the words of her founder, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Thank you. We have a, a few moments. Um, if there are any questions, we have a microphone here. We invite you to come forward. Let's see what time it is. Hi. Hello, Doctor. Thank you for coming. Um, one thing I was wondering about is that another point of attack of the Catholic Church is on the sale of indulgences. I wonder if you could give us a little, little better illustration of the history of that. Um, 
Now, of course, my colleague, uh, Jim Hitchcock, is much closer to that, but I'll, but I'll uh, give it a shot. He'll correct me, trust me, if I make a mistake. <laughs> um, the, uh, the sale of indulgence, is, uh, it's, it has a fairly long history. It actually began um, during the period of the Crusades. In the, in the 13th century, uh, a crusader could, could take the cross and could go on crusade. And because it was very dangerous and very expensive, it was a real act of penance. It was a pilgrimage. Uh, then he would receive this full indulgence. But by the 13th century, people were saying, well, what about people who can't be crusaders? What about the elderly and women? Um, but what if they made it possible for a warrior to go on crusade? Uh, in other words, they provided the, the funds that he needed to be able to go, provided his armor, provided the materials that he needed. Um, and so what the church said was, yes, if you make that sacrifice and you allow for a crusader to be able to take the cross and complete his vow, then that, that also is an act of penance and you will receive a, a full indulgence. Now the problem is once you get money involved in something um, and then just wind it up for a few centuries and you start to get abuse. And so as time went on, this became more and more of a reliable form of uh, income in different areas. Uh, sometimes you might not have a crusade that was going uh, but you probably will have one later, and so you would just collect the, the money anyways. Or perhaps there was no crusade, but you could use the money for the good work of the church. Uh, and, and that was used for charitable purposes or for other things um, that the church was doing. But the fact is, is that money got involved in it. Uh, theologically, uh, there was nothing wrong with this. The people who were giving the money were doing an act of penance. The problem became that too many lawyers got involved in this. And, and so what it got down to was, well, if you're not really, really hurting on this penance, you're only hurting a little bit, then you wouldn't get a full indulgence, you get a partial indulgence. Um, and then, then all of this ended up because of, you essentially got like salesmen who became involved in it. Um, and it projected to the common people uh, something which, which it really wasn't, um, at least not canonically, it, but it's, it looked like the sale of indulgence. And so a lot of people like Erasmus, um, uh, good Catholics, uh, were very critical of it. And that kind of, that, that belief that these things were being sold, and I mean, I, 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 there were definitely people who were going out with these indulgences who were not doing, I mean, the most famous example is, of course, Johann Tetzel, who who uh, had slogans, you know, when the, the coin in the coffer rings, the soul to heaven springs. Um, so those were the sort of things which, uh, um, which, which were abuses. And the church, I should say, the church regularly throughout church history, because it's peopled by sinners, it regularly has periods in which it needs to reform and in which it goes and it looks at where are the abuses, where are people not living according to the way that Christ uh, wants his church uh, to live, and then they go in and um, and they fix it, and that's what reform movements are all about. Was that okay? <laughs> I'm Father James Wetram from Jesuit Hall, at uh, here in St. Louis. <clears throat> Back in the year 2000 or 1999. 1,909. Uh, Pope uh, John Paul II was preparing for what he considered the most important part of the Jubilee year, <clears throat> to ask pardon of God for the uh, sins committed by uh, people in the church in the previous millennium. And the Pontifical Theological Commission drew up a document of 30 pages to help him distinguished between uh, things which may appear to us by our present norms when things uh, which they objectively were sinful. And I find it a very, very instructive document. Helps me to avoid the sin of presentism. Mm -hmm. We mentioned judging the past by the norms of the present. I wonder if you make use of that in you at all. Yes, I agree with you. Presentism is a is a, it's not just for Catholic history, but it's a major problem for, for uh, historical history. understanding in any case. Presentism, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's like a historical fallacy. It's an, it's an assumption, it's kind of a, uh, an arrogance, really, 
that assumes that everything that we currently think today is right and everything that people in the past thought is wrong. And that it also assumes something that we know is not true, that all of our prejudices or all of the things that we think are the most important um, are, are permanent and they're eternal. But in fact, we know just, if you just look in the last 20 or 30 years, they change all the time. Um, but the present is, is that the people in the past uh, were wrong and they should be judged according to our standards because our standards are eternal. Um, it's, a, it's a fallacy, it's, it's not useful um, and most historians try, uh, try to avoid it, particularly in medieval history. And I can say this is very strong in crusade studies. Uh, one of the reasons I think crusade studies led the way in a lot of other approaches to medieval history is the desire to understand these things on their own terms. Um, and to understand how these people looked at it, how did they approach it. And that's why, although I am a Catholic, um, there are many uh, medieval historians, many, when I think of all the great crusade historians in the world, many of them are not c Catholic. In fact, I would say the vast majority of them are not Catholic, uh, but they're historians. And they are honestly trying to understand how those people saw things, um, saw things back, back then. I just want to make one comment. Uh, for 29 years, I taught church history to Mother Teresa's sisters in Rome, mm -hmm. and I used the example of one of the popes from the 10th century of the evils of the papacy, uh, John XII, who, according to one tradition, died committed adultery. Well, um, I did ta I taught that to the novices, particularly to so that they would get a grasp about the possibility of, of sinfulness in the, among people in the church. Well, Mother Teresa seemed to like this. She wanted my notes for all of her novitiates. So she had a very real grasp of the possibility of human evil, as well as the importance of doing good. My name is uh, Mike Dooley, and this will probably be a very political and correct question, but you mentioned the Crusades being fought because of uh, the objectives of Islam. Has that changed, the objectives of Islam? Um, well, I'm not going to speak for Islam today. I'm really a medieval historian. Um, but uh, even in the Middle Ages, there's not one objective. There are many, many Muslims in the world and there were many different uh, uh, approaches. When the Crusades actually began, uh, the primary problem, the reason that they were called was the Turks. Uh, the, the Turks were a Muslim group that had conquered Asia Minor, uh, captured all those Christian lands. They'd also conquered the Holy Land and caused much of this, this uh, problem. Um, but prior to the Turks, the Holy Land had, had been held for centuries by the Arabs and things were fine. Um, so had things remained that way, it's, it's very unlikely the Crusades would have ever been launched. So there are different groups. And I think this is one of the, the problems uh, even today is that people often, uh, it, they don't, it, it's complicated. I mean, you look at the Middle, a Middle East, there's a lot of groups there. There's ethnicities, there's uh, different approaches to Islam, um, and then there's also, as we know, the Christian minorities. I will say that one thing that kind of struck me is looking back to the, the time of the Crusades uh, was recently the, the amount of attacks that have been happening because of ISIS against Christian groups there. And in fact, the Holy Father bringing this to the attention of the world. In some ways, it reminded me of Urban going to the people in Europe and saying, someone should do something about this. Um, we should not allow our Christian brothers and sisters to be preyed on in this way. Are you saying that, the, that when the Turks were fighting, it wasn't necessarily religious driven? It just happened to be a coincidence? No, they... it's religious. OK. Yes, it's a jihad. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to thank you all for um, the, the questions. And at this time, I'd like to invite our president rector, Father Horn, to come forward. Dr. Mann, you've, uh, the Holy Spirit, through the gift of faith in your heart, has certainly released a contagion of deepening faith among us tonight. And I don't know what, what better uh, praise and thanks we could give you than to point to that. So 
we are immensely grateful. Thank you so much. As we move to give uh, you the Kenrick uh, Medallion, I do want to pause and thank uh, Dr. John Gresham, the academic dean here, Monsignor Ramakadi, who's chair of the Lectures and work Workshops Committee, and the members of that committee who've worked very hard to prepare the beauty of this evening, um, Mary Ann Rotter, who uh, pulled this all together uh, for us all. A special thanks to Mary Ann. Also, thank you for coming. This is one of the largest crowds I've seen here at the Kenrick uh, Lecture in, in several years. So thank you so much, the lay leaders, religious sisters, brother priests. Thanks so much. Archbishop Peter Richard Kenrick in 1843 became the second bishop of the Diocese of St. Louis. Five years later, he became its first archbishop. During his more than 50 years as a diocesan ordinary, Kenrick guided the Catholic Church in the Midwest through a period of unprecedented growth and expansion. I'm pointing this out. It's on the back of your program. You can look at it later and savor. Uh, it's very beautiful. He presided over a vast archdiocese, which included much of the northwest quadrant of what is now the continental United States. At one time, you probably know there were two dioceses in the United States, Baltimore, everything east of the Mississippi, and St. Louis, everything west of the Mississippi. A le rector likes to remind sending dioceses of that <laughs> so they can come home, they can come home to St. Louis. Archbishop Kenrick was also an academic an intellectual who made important contributions to the theological dialogue of his time. He was an active participant in several significant topics considered by the fathers of the First, First Vatican Council. And furthermore, he was respected by his peers in the hierarchy of the church as a skilled debater who brought knowledge and understanding to almost every conversation and serious inquiry. Throughout his years of service as Archbishop of St. Louis, Peter Richard Kenrick maintained an unwavering commitment to priestly education and formation for the seminarians of his diocese. How proud he must be when you think of 14 sending dioceses here and all, all but a full house of 130 seminarians, how you've prepared them as evangelists to equip and bring this message to the people. We're also very proud that Dr. Madden teaches here and has taught here. Um, Peter Richard Kenrick maintained this unwavering commitment to priestly education and formation, and today this seminary proudly bears his name and honors him by this annual Kenrick Lecture. The class of 1944 were indebted to who endowed this lecture series, and those men have all gone home. In faith we pray to the Lord and we want to bid them thanks this evening. So Archbishop Carlson, if you'd come forward to award, to present the medallion. Dr. Madden, with great gratitude, it's our honor to present you this evening the Kenrick Lecture Medallion. This concludes our evening, and uh, I'd ask for Archbishop to come forward for the blessing, and I'd like to remind you all that um, we have more desserts and good foods. I hope you don't have to rush home, uh, and I think they're right outside in the hallway. So uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, please come back and join us for future events. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless.